on them, where it is on. So now we're going to do just a little, something I don't normally do at all, but I can't resist giving you some historical background and context for Nietzsche. Uh, it's not the usual sort of existentialist thing to do. It doesn't matter what the facts are. It sort of matters what they, how they live their lives. So Heidegger, whom I mention every once in a while, the, or Kierkegaard too, the sort of puts the facts of history just out of it. I mean, Kierkegaard says that all you need to know about Jesus is that he, that he, what is it, that he was a case of eternity and time. Everything else is irrelevant. What, he, what, what morality he preached, that he was a carpenter, that, uh, uh, that, that anything, according to Kierkegaard, it's just that God became a, a human being at a certain place at a certain time. That's it. And uh, the... Who was that I was going to say next? Wait a second. Besides, Kier oh, Kierkegaard says that. Oh, I was, it's, it's Heidegger says himself that uh, when he was teaching an Aristotle course, his courses, you can get them all now, dozens of them published. Anyway, says about Aristotle, all you need to know about Aristotle is he lived, he did philosophy, and he died. Now let's turn to the text. So, and I sort of like that, but I'm, so I'm apologizing for the fact that I'm going to give you a little bit of a historical background. You, it, you, they, they would consider it useless gossip, I think. But um, so it turns out that Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky and Nietzsche all wrote at roughly the same time, around 1850. And then, so Kierkegaard first in 1850, that's when he, uh, that's the time for fear and trembling, roughly. Then Dostoevsky and Nietzsche in a way, we're at exactly the same time. The Brothers Karamazov is published in 1881 and The Gay Science in 1882. You see, that's the kind of trivial fact that I, no one could resist mentioning. Uh, and then the uh, Twilight and the Antichrist are from 1888. So this raises one interesting question, which you should keep in the back of your mind, and I'm ready to hear any suggestions you've got. You'll see me worrying about it. It, it is not, nobody knows where, how much Dostoevsky Nietzsche read, though it was available in German. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Is there any evidence you should be asking yourself as you read the Nietzsche uh, that Dostoevsky's read the Brothers Karamazov? It's more likely, it looks like, that he read The Idiot, if he read any. But, but it's, it's fun to keep in mind. And there are hints, I think, that maybe he did read the Brothers Karamazov. So let's go on. So... So how much does Nietzsche know of his two greatest opponents? Because he really, and Pascal was his third favorite opponent, he really likes these people who share the whole anti-Platonic, anti-philosophical approach with him. And so he feels they're on the same wavelength. And then he sees that they accept the Christian way of life. That makes them the big existential opponents and so you, I'll read you some quotes about all that. First, he'd heard about Kierkegaard, but he didn't have time to read him. His best friend, Georg Brandes, wrote to him in 1888. That's when he's writing Twilight and Antichrist. Quote, there's a Nordic thinker, Soren Kierkegaard, whose works would interest you if only they were translated. See, that come, unfortunately, they aren't in German. They're only in Danish. So that's a problem. And he goes on, he is, in my view, uh, this what Georg Brandes says, one of the deepest psychologists on the whole there has ever, there has ever been. But psychologist obviously doesn't mean some, you know, means somebody, existential psychologist who, whose understanding of despair and being reborn and important things like that. Nietzsche answers, for my next trip to Germany, I resolved to occupy myself with the psychological problem of Kierkegaard. Now, I don't know whether Nietzsche thinks he can read Danish or whether he supposes that by his next trip uh, he will be able to, uh, that they will be translated. I, but, it, it's, but he doesn't get to because Nietzsche, you know, he, you, you do know or probably know reading any of the introductions and stuff, Nietzsche cracked up and went just totally crazy, but not in a, in a dramatic sort of way first, raving and banging on the piano and saying that he was Jesus and, Dionysius, and then sort of relapsed into a kind of coma for 11 years. But he, and that all happened so quickly 
after 1888, I don't know exactly the date, that he never got to read Kierkegaard. But he did get involved, in a way, with Dostoevsky. And you can see about that, maybe some of you noticed. Did anybody notice the notes in Twilight where they talk about Dostoevsky uh, on 202 of of Twilight in a footnote uh, of a glossary of names when they decide when they when they decide to explain who Fyodor Dostoevsky was, they uh, we have a quote from Nietzsche. A few weeks ago, I did not even know the name of Dostoevsky. A chance reach in a bookstore brought to my notice a work just translated into French. Maybe that's how he expects to read Kierkegaard. I don't know. L'esprit souterrain, which is notes from underground. The instinct of kinship or what shall I call it, spoke immediately. My joy was extraordinary. So, and then it's skipping a little. Whether he read all or any of the four great novels is unknown, and so forth. Uh, and on, in, on page 110 of Twilight, I assigned just this page 110 because I wanted you to just see it. About two-thirds of the way down, He says, Dostoevsky, the only psychologist, by the way, from whom I had anything to learn. He's one of the happiest accidents of my life, even more than my discovery of Stendhal. This profound human being who was ten times justified in despising the superficial Germans. That's just an aside. Kierkegaard, uh, Nietzsche is Swiss, and German is his native language. He's from Basel, but he doesn't like the Germans at all. I don't know if he likes the Swiss either. I doubt it. But uh, there's probably no country, no, no culture he likes, but he dislikes Germans particularly. And, and so does Dostoevsky. The only nice thing he ever says about Germans is Dr. Herzenstube, the one who gave Dimitri the nuts. Usually Germans are doctors in Dostoevsky, and usually they don't understand what's really going on. They think it's brain fever, whereas it's really revelation. Yeah. Who who is this? Uh, Nietzsche. The East is better than West. I doubt it. You have to show me that because at least Buddhism he can't stand because, of course, it's, it's, I mean, he's all for passionate involvement. Non-attachment and meditation are just not his thing at all. But so what he would find in the East, I don't know. But, of course, he doesn't like the West either because the West has been sold out since, since Homer, which he likes a lot has been lost, so to speak, to to anything good. So Nietzsche Nietzsche has a hard time because he really sees through so much that other people accept. He has this line that he's doing philosophy with a hammer, which means not only that he's sort of hitting you over the head with what he thinks. You must have had this feeling when you read it that he's sort of in your face, kind of screaming at you all the time and saying outrageous things. And that's his, so to speak, protest against the very style of doing philosophy, which was calm and ordered and uh, uh, reflective and, and impersonal. For him, it's extremely involved and disordered and personal. And uh, he, he's, he, he, just, he studies philosophy, but he doesn't really want to write that way. But why am I saying this? I'm going to get off on this strange tax. Let me think a minute. Uh, oh, about East and West. Oh, yeah, just that he's, he's against all of this and, his very, and that his style would be the furthest from any kind of serenity, which he would probably think of as Eastern. And his style is also farthest from any kind of theoretical rationality, which he thinks of as Western. So I was just saying, well, with a hammer. Now I got it back. When he says he philosophizes with a hammer, he doesn't, he doesn't really mean that he's hitting you over the head with everything, although he does that, and it's important that he does that because he's so radically breaking with everything. But he says he's testing all the ideas that, and, that people believe in and sort of knocking them to see if they're hollow, and they all turn out to be hollow. He's the most radical questioner of what everybody believes that ever was, I think. And uh, after Nietzsche, it's very much harder to believe in a lot of the things that people believe.
believed in before he went around hitting them with a hammer. So where were we? You want to say something? I read your mind. Go ahead, what? Like Socrates? Yes. Yes. He says it seems like Socrates testing beliefs to see if they hold up. Yes. And why is it so radically different than Socrates? There's something way that Socrates tests them, which is something that he disapproves of completely. What would it be? I forget how many of you, I probably think I asked you this, have read any Socrates, have read uh, the Apology and Crito and things that people do read in high school sometimes. Uh, but, and, okay, well, Socrates, you wouldn't know this then, but he's te going around testing all these Athenian beliefs by rational means. He's seeing how much they can be defended against any objections and how they can be self-critical and stand up to and, and, and be shown to be reasonable or else be rejected. I mean, that's not how Nietzsche's testing them. Nietzsche's testing them in a much more what? He would say genealogical way. He's trying to tell you sort of how they developed, what needs that people had that they, that they helped, and how they kept people from being strong and, and mature and is what's wrong with them. And... And, and Socrates, you, you, this is part of today's lecture, and Socrates is, after all, remember, if you've got a chance to read it, the, his, the, the ultimate decadent, because Socrates needs rational arguments to defend what he's doing and tell him what to do, and Nietzsche thinks that's all wrong, in the name of something very interesting, which we're going to get to in a minute. So where are we? Uh, I'm just reading, okay, on, on, on uh, 110, did I read it? Yes. Okay, so now, uh, but it's funny, what I'm reading is different than what I wrote here, so I have to think about this a minute. Isn't that interesting? Where does he say what I have written down here? Uh, I, I've written the following as if it was on Twilight, page 110, but I don't see it. If you see it, let me know. And if it isn't there, where could it be? But here is what I quote. Uh, Nietzsche says, ah, maybe that's what I just read on 202. Let's look. No, I don't know where it is. It's interesting. He, he says to somebody, I treasure him, that's Dostoevsky, as the most valuable psychological material I know. I am in a remarkable way thankful to him, even though he always goes against my deepest instincts, similar to my relation to Pascal, whom I almost love because he's taught me so much, the only logical Christian. That is, Pascal is completely wrong, but he's wrong in this very deep, Way now, where, where, where I don't see that. Do you see that? Where did I get it? Well, if I can't find it in a minute, I just go and tell you, tell you, tell you next time where I got it. Okay, I don't know where I got it. Um, so now, as did Dostoevsky know any Nietzsche? That's the next question. No, but it's much more interesting. Much more interesting than sort of history of influences, as far as I'm concerned. Dostoevsky was such a genius; he made up Nietzsche. There's a character in The Possessed named Kirillov who's very Nietzschean. There is a lot of Nietzsche talk in The Brothers Karamazov. We haven't paid attention to it, but we're going to. That's why you should bring The Brothers back again. Dostoevsky is making up exactly the, uh, the position that, uh, the, the, well, lots of positions that uh, uh, does that Nietzsche holds? There was one just going across my mind. I'm thinking of it. Uh, no, I, I think it would get out of the order to do to do it now. So let's not talk about that yet. Um, so it turns out then that Dostoevsky and Nietzsche have a lot in common. Dostoevsky says, I mean Nietzsche says, and I think Dostoevsky would agree. 
in the sense that he made him up and then knows, knows, him and knows his views without ever having read a word of him. So we're going to look at what they have in common today for the rest of the time. And I'm going to put off until later what it is they disagree about. We, I've already said they disagree about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to live the kind of life that Dostoevsky thinks is the Christian life. And, and if, say, whether it's nice to be like Alyosha, a good thing or not. We'll worry about that later. Finally, and then when we do, just to sort of show where we are because we're so near the end of the course, I mean, after trying to see how Nietzsche's like uh, uh, Dostoevsky, and then we can see how he's not like Dostoevsky. And in the end, you have to ask yourself sort of which side are you on because they're so radically opposed. In, in the last lecture, we have to talk about uh, how you would decide and, and what's at stake if you, which, on which, who, you, uh, who, you, who you like and, want to, and think has important advice to give you. But that's ahead of the story. So let's go back. We start with Nietzsche on the Homeric Greeks. We're going to see later that what Nietzsche has to say about the Athenian Greeks, the philosophical Greeks, is going to look a lot like Dostoevsky. But before we do that, we have to look at a distinction, which if you don't know it, will confuse you very much. Because Nietzsche talks about the Greeks, and sometimes he means the Homeric Greeks, and sometimes he means the Greeks in Athens at the time of Socrates, which is about 700 years after Homer. And, the, and he's all for the Homeric Greeks, as you'll see in a minute, and totally against the Socratic Athenian philosophical Greeks. And they're called Hellens, H-E-L-L-E-N-S, the, the Homeric ones. You just need to know that sort of like code to follow what's going on. And the next stage is called Hellenistic. That is, it's a sort of it's a kind of copy or something or degeneration of the, of the Hellens. So he's for the Hellens, but he's against the Hellenistic Greeks. And that's just, I say that only just so you won't be confused as you read it. I wonder if they're in this list of names at the end, whether we, I never thought to look, whether they tell you about that. No, they don't tell you. Nobody tells you. It just goes by. Uh, why they're called Helens, I don't know. It has nothing to do with Helen of, of Troy, and of, of the wife of Agamemnon and stuff. I have no idea. Does anybody over there know why, why these early Greeks are called Helens? Well, anyway, just keep your eye open. So now we're going to read Nietzsche on the Greeks. Uh, he thought these Homeric Greeks... How many have read the Odyssey? Hooray. How many have read the Iliad? Wow. Ahead of... Me, practically. I mean, I read the Odyssey over and over, but the Iliad is too much for me. I only read it once. But uh, anyway, I, I teach the Odyssey in Philosophy 6, but I haven't dared yet teach the Iliad. So, but, but in both books, you can see the Greeks being passionate, involved, and, and now comes this interesting Nietzsche way of looking at it, trusting their instincts. That's what we have to talk about for a while. Because it sounds like, if you just use the normal word instinct, that it would mean something automatic, like birds have instincts for building nests and so forth. But that's not at all what Nietzsche means by people's instincts. It's not something that you are born with, it's something innate. It's something you think you acquire by a long, long experience. What, what, what makes it instinct for Nietzsche is that it's unreflective, spontaneous, action. I think that's all I need to say about that. Yeah. Uh, so that's more that I've said about all I want to say about instinct. To sum up, noble instinct, which the Homeric Greeks had, is, is the source of impulsive, spontaneous, unreflective, but totally successful uh, actions, generally successful. Be different than you realize, and your past training may lead you astray. But basically, you you do the appropriate thing at the appropriate time in the appropriate way, and you, in a sense, win at whatever you're doing. Uh, and now, so much for the Homeric Greeks. Now we get to the Socratic Greeks. <clears throat> they they had lost it, 
And that's what he's talking about on page 43. And this is typically radical new uh, Nietzschean idea. You've got to realize, and since most of you haven't been reading uh, yet, uh, Socrates' uh, defense, Plato's defense of Socrates and what a great guy he was because he made all the Athenians reflect and justify anything they did. Uh, for, that's the hero of our culture. Uh, Socrates. He, Plato was a great, uh, what does he need? Uh, uh, who are the people you hire to, get, to put the right spin on what, you, what you're doing? A, sort of a press agent or, or what's agent? There's another word for it, isn't there? Hmm? Yes, a public relations person. Yeah, Plato was a great public relations person for Socrates. He put this incredible spin on it, how great Socrates was for Athens, what luck they had to have him. The Athenians were smart enough not to buy it. They weren't completely decadent yet. And they, sent, they thought that he was a disaster for reasons that you ought to be able to figure out. But if you haven't figured it out, you think about it. He's telling these people who presumably have at least some remaining instincts about what's the right and wrong thing to do, that they shouldn't do anything until they reflect on it and justify it. And he goes around stopping everybody on the street corners and asking them, why are they doing what they are doing, which they thought they were just, they just knew what they were doing. And they discover they can't explain what they were doing. And they sort of, again, become like the second base when they aren't able to do anything. By the time they leave Socrates, they're just in a kind of trance. They, they know that he's taken away from them their ability to do what they were doing. And he hasn't given them really any ability to justify what they're doing because it turns out Socrates is always, he's got this pure, critical kind of intelligence, which has nothing constructive to say. And so Nietzsche thinks he's, he's a very bad guy. And interestingly enough, Kierkegaard wrote his PhD thesis on Socrates. It was called The Concept of Irony. And Kierkegaard thought that Socrates was an, an interesting case of somebody who uh, undermined the values of the culture, because the values of the culture aren't rational. And you can't define why it's rational to do what the ethics of that culture says to do. It's just is what the ethics of that culture says to do. There is no right answer about what you're supposed to do, uh, Nietzsche thinks. So the, so, and Kierkegaard thinks too. So Socrates, by questioning the values the morals of the Greeks, insofar as he succeeded, undermined their intuitive ability to do what in that culture was the appropriate thing to do. So, now, so Socrates turns out to be dangerous. And now we read a lot about Socrates in here where Nietzsche is sort of taking him apart. Um, what he says is that in the Athens of Socrates, the, their, the, the instincts had become, as he puts it, about uh, uh, six lines down on 43. The instincts, no, 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 not the, uh, a little, four, four lines down. Everywhere the instincts were in anarchy. Everywhere people were but five steps from excess. They had monstrous souls, and that was the universal danger. That means you ju they couldn't count on what they just did spontaneously anymore. So now it's sort of complicated. Instinct means acting just spontaneously without reflection. If you're healthy, psychologically, that's good. But if you've lost your healthy psychal state, then just doing what you spontaneously feel like doing is back in lower immediacy. So the Athenians, for reasons that he doesn't go into, but just so you can sort of see that this isn't just craziness on Nietzsche's part, Thucydides in his story about the Peloponnesian Wars it sort of explains how the Athenians fell apart. They were just wonderfully instinctive and, and had a kind of consensus about what to do, but then they had a plague which wiped out a whole lot of them. Then they got in a war trying to be an empire, and, they, and then they started sending out, you know, they had a direct democracy, so every day they could vote on what to do, and then they'd send out the generals to attack some country say, Iraq now, and then they'd change their mind and they'd call the generals back and court-martial them and then they'd send some other general out to attack some other country. 
they got completely confused and hopeless. At just the, and they were in this confused state just at the time that Plato and Socrates came along. Nietzsche just takes that, that we know that for granted when he says that their instincts were an anarchy because that's what Thucydides says and nobody knows anything about it except what they read in Thucydides. So, and he says at the bottom of 42, Socrates saw behind his aristocratic Athenians, he grasped that his case, the idiosyncrasy of his case was already no longer exceptional. His case was that he had lost his instincts, we'll see. The same kind of degeneration was everywhere silently preparing itself. The old Athens was coming to an end. And Socrates understood that all the world had need of him, his expedient, his cure, his personal art of self-preservation. Everywhere the instincts were in anarchy, and now skipping a little, the instincts want to play the tyrant. We must find a counter-tyrant who is stronger. And then when you go down a little more, um, where's the counter-tyrant? Well, the counter-tyrant is on the next section. If you go down to section 10, if one needs to make a tyrant of reason, as Socrates did, then there must exist no little danger of something else playing the tyrant. Rationality was at that time divined as a savior. Neither Socrates nor his invalids were free to be rational or not. As they wished, it was de rigueur. It was their last expedient. The fanaticism with which the whole Greek thought throws itself at rationality. That means Socrates, Plato particularly. Um, betrays a state of emergency. One was in peril. One had only one choice, either to perish or be absurdly rational. Uh, and that's, so that's what happens according to him. Let me just catch up. Socrates is the prime example. And on 43, uh, that we got that already. Uh, that makes him a pseudo-Greek in the sense that he's not like the good old Homeric Greeks. So you, this is where you've got to keep track of who's what. Uh, so in, in number two on 39, about the, the very last line of the page, I recognize Socrates and Plato as symptoms of decay, as agents of the dissolution of Greece, Greece as pseudo-Greeks, as anti-Greek. Well, you get confused unless you realize he means anti-Homeric Greeks, that they'd lost it. They lost this wonderful sort of mastery and skill that the Homeric Greek had. Uh, you can see on 41 that those are the real Greeks at the bottom of section 4. He says, I seek to understand out of a, what uh, idiosyncrasy that Socratic question, equation, reason equal virtue equal happiness derives that bizarrest of equations and one which has a particular, has in particular all the instincts of the older Helens, there you uh, see it, uh, against it. That's the Homeric ones. Um, and these later Greeks used reason to control their instincts and that was a fatal flaw. On 43, he's talking about all that. We, we just read that. I think I read that. Yeah, okay. Uh, and all that he calls decadence on, um, on the next page, on 44, the end of 11. To have to combat one's instincts, that's a formula for decadence. As long as life is ascending, happiness and instinct are one. And now you can see why. I mean, if you could just spontaneously, skillfully, and generally successfully go through life as if you were a sort of champion, a, a master of whatever, that would, make you, that would be, keep you happy. And, it, and reason is not part of that. Reason is, uh, is, uh, would undermine that. Now, you might, and, and that means that philosophers, he now generalizes, because those are the first philosophers, and they started this thing about reason. And that means that philosophers are decadent on 119 about 15 lines down. But the philosophers are the decadence of Hellenism. You see there, that's the Athenians. The counter movement against the old, the noble taste. That is spontaneously doing the, the noble thing. Against the agonal instinct. That means the instinct for con uh, confrontation and combat of a good sort in, in games, 
in the Olympic Games, for instance, or in in the kind of in their wars. Uh, agonal instinct against the polis. That's uh, against the the city when it worked. See, Athens was, worked for a while, and then everybody did have good instincts. For those who know any history under Pericles, then it was a perfect, perfect democracy. They all voted and they all agreed, and everything went very well. But they've lost it. So, and they've lost the sense of the unity of the city of the polis against the value of the race, against the authority of tradition. See, you've got to have a tradition, of course, if you're going to be able to learn to do things the right way, because what the right way is, is simply what's good according to the tradition. And if you start questioning the tradition, the way Socrates and Plato did, saying, well, that's just, you know, what people say and what people think. We, we, we don't want that. We, want the, we, want what, we don't want to know what's good, to put it in contemporary terms. We want a theory of what's right. We want a theory of justice, never mind what you just happened to uh, intuit that justice is. Well, that make, that's what leads them wrong, makes them wrong. So it's the, against, the, against all that, the Socratic virtues were preached because the Greeks had lost them. Excitable, timid, fickle, comedians, everyone, they had more than enough reason to let morality be preached to them. Not that it would do, have done any good, but big words and fine attitudes are suitable to decadence. This is just an outrageous thing in the face of the 2,000 years of, of, of Socrates' worship. And he, this, is, this is Nietzsche taking on everything. Let's see now. But, oh, yeah, I wrote here, and why should we believe his view about what was going on in Greece? Well, partly it doesn't matter. He's making up his story. They're, they're against the other interpretation. But at least you should realize that he was an authority on Greek culture. He was a superstar of Greek philology, which means knowing the Greek language and everything written in the Greek language. You can get everything written in, in, in Athenian Greek on one CD, I read somewhere. And that's quite, quite surprising. And so Nietzsche knew it all. So, and he was so smart that he got tenure at the age of 24 at the University of Basel. He was an absolute superstar. And then he just quit all that and went out and wrote these books. So now, let me see where we are. Okay, now, back to, for a minute to Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky and how, the, how they deal with this. Kierkegaard is still, remember I said, the last one who sees that mediation is a stage that it's a good thing to go through because he understands that it's a good thing to question the rationality of your superstitions and your phobias and your fanaticisms and your, uh, and your desires. And, then that it's, and if you use philosophy that way, it's a, a means to get rid of lower immediacy and make a place for higher immediacy. That's Kierkegaard. And that's interesting. And Kierkegaard would say, but now, why is Kierkegaard then not like a philosopher? Well, why? Anybody know? I mean, he, he likes mediation, but it's a means, not an end. It's a means of getting rid of lower immediacy and thereby a means to sort of clear a space for higher immediacy. But it's not something that you should build your life around. And that's what philosophers do, according to Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. They're interested in people who not who just not not they're not upset with people who study philosophy. They're people who they're upset with people who live like Plato and Socrates said philosophers should live, namely detached, theoretical, denying their bodies, denying any involvement with local concerns and so forth. So so but Kierkegaard is the last that, of the existentialists that has any place of value for rationality and reflection and philosophy. Because for Dostoevsky and Nietzsche, philosophy isn't even a means. Now, we haven't talked about Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky doesn't directly attack uh, uh, Socrates, but he does certainly attack Western detached critical rationality. And how does he attack it? Well, who's the philosopher in the Brothers Karamazov? 
who, who went to the university and studied natural philosophy? Hmm? Ivan. And yes, and who's the detached one? And the rational one? And the theoretical one? Well, Ivan. He's the incarnation of, well, I, that word, you better not, he's the, a, the paradigm case of a philosophy minded person. And what becomes of Ivan? Well, he's dangerous and sick and suffering, and there's nothing good you can say about it. But he's decadent in, in, in the Nietzschean sense of decadent. He's, he, he, doesn't, he had one moment in which he did something impulsive. He picked up the peasant. And if he had gone on with something impulsive and confessed to the police, who knows what would have happened. But he managed to, uh, there's this joke, if you, have, if, you, if you have this intense desire to do something, you, you should lie down till it goes away. Well, that's, that's how Ivan, I mean, when Ivan has an impulsive, intense desire to do something, his attitude is to, well, let's wait till tomorrow, it'll go away. And that's what happened. So, so Ivan, who was from the beginning a detached spectator, an eyewitness, uh, denies his involvement in the world, denies his involvement in life, and that makes him sick and dangerous. And now we get back, yeah, we just have time, to the way Socrates is decadent and how that's related to the way Ivan is decadent. I think I've got half of it done already. Yes, so there was the decadence. I'm just making sure of catching up with myself for a second. 39. Well, we've got to add something from page 39 because it's people. Now we're switching to something specific. How do philosophers and Ivan relate to life? And, sorry, and, and, and at the top of 39, Nietzsche says, in every age, the wisest have passed the identical judgment on life. It's worthless. He's being ironic about wisest. He means the people who take, we take to be wisest, like Plato and Socrates. Everywhere and always their mouths have uttered the same sound, a sound full of doubt, full of melancholy, full of weariness with life, full of opposition to life. Even Socrates said as he died, to die that means to be a long time sick. That is, his whole life was sick. And now that he's dying, he's getting well. He said, I owe a cock to the savior Escalapius. That means that, we turn, if you read the footnote, that uh, you give a cock, a, a rooster, to your doctor as paying him off when you're recovering from an illness. So Socrates is recovering from an illness. What illness? Being alive. And when, now that he's dying, he considers this being cured of being alive, and he says he's going to give the doctor a reward. So, he, so Nietzsche says, even Socrates has had enough of, had had enough of it. Always, what that proves... What is, what's the point? Well, uh, they're skipping a little. Here at any rate, there's something sick. That's our retort. One ought to take a closer look at them, these wisest. Were all of them perhaps no longer steady on their legs? Belated, tottery, decadence? Does wisdom perhaps appear on earth as a raven which is inspired by the smell of carrion? I mean, Nietzsche just goes on and on saying marvelous things like that. Uh, and now we get to where he converges with Ivan uh, on 40. Uh, it's about the value of life. Remember what, what Ivan is up to. He, wants to. he thinks that life isn't valuable, the world isn't valuable, that he's going to kill himself when he gets to be 30. He'd kill himself sooner, but he can't quite get over the attraction of the sticky green leaves on the one hand and Kater, Katerina on the other. But as soon as he does... He's going to get out of this life. And so now we've got to connect this uh, with this issue about the value of life on page 40, about 15 lines down. Judgments, value judgments concerning life, for or against, can in the last retort never be true. This is Nietzsche's view. They possess value only as symptoms. They come into consideration only as symptoms, uh, as judgments, their stupidities. And their symptoms, what? Of sickness, decadence. One must reach out and try to grasp this astonishing finesse that the value of life cannot be estimated, not by a living man because he's a party to the dispute. That means, remember, that what I, Ivan didn't realize, that he's just alive already. He can't just join it or leave it the way you join or leave a fraternity or sorority or a 
or uh, whatever. So he's a party to it. Indeed, it's object and not the judge of it. Not by a dead, you can't, dead people can't judge life because they're dead and living people can't judge life because they're too close to it. For a philosopher to see a problem in the value of life thus even constitutes an objection to him. Well, that's exactly Ivan. He's a philosopher. He's asking about the value of life and it's an objection. He has got, he's got a position, Nietzsche is saying, that nobody can have. Namely, as if he was standing outside of life, judging it, weighing it. He's making exactly the same objection that Dostoevsky made. It, it constitutes an objection, a question mark as to his wisdom, a piece of unwisdom. What? And these wise men, they have not only been decadent, they are not even wise, and so forth. Okay, so, and, and now just a quick reference to the brothers on, on page 224, you don't have it with you because I didn't tell you to bring it, but you can look on 224. They have a brief discussion, Alyosha and Ivan, about the value of life. On page 224, um, Ivan is saying that he loves the blue sky and the sticky leaves. And, and, and he, do you understand? He says to Alyosha, I understand, uh, uh, Ivan, one loves with one's inside, with one's stomach. You said it so well. I am awfully glad you have such a longing for life. I think everyone should love life above everything in the world. And then Ivan backs off and says, love life more than the meaning of it? See, this is, that's the wrong move. To sort of step outside now and ask whether you should love it depending on what it means. Because Aliyasha answers, certainly, love it regardless of logic, as you say. It must be regardless of logic. It is only then one can understand the meaning of it. I've thought so for a long time. And so it's the same point. Alyosha is saying to Ivan, you can't step outside and ask about the meaning of life and decide whether, to, judging it, whether it's, it's, good, got a, it's good or bad, whether you should join it or not. You're, you're in it, and if, this is something that Nietzsche thinks too, if you get really involved in it, you will, you will be joyful and appreciate it. But if you stop and withdraw and ask yourself, whether you should become involved in it, you're lost. That's, they both agree on that. Now, I just got time to finish. Um, so the philosopher is weak and decadent. Otherwise, he wouldn't even try to step outside of life and become detached and judge it. That's what Nietzsche says on 55. And the way he says it is very interesting. Look at this on 55. Um, Where? 155. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not on 55. Here we are. Okay, in, the, in number 5 on 55. I'm it's about five lines down. For a condemnation of life by the living is, after all, no more than a symptom of a certain kind of life. The question whether the condemnation is just or unjust has not been raised at all. One would have to be situated outside life. So that's the same point again. Now, uh, now I want the punchline at the top of 5. If one has grasped the blasphemousness of such a rebellion against life as has in Christian morality become virtually sacrosanct, one has fortunately therewith grasped something else as well. The uselessness, illusoriness, absurdity, falsity of such a rebellion. Remember what Ivan's chapter is called where he gives back the world? It's called rebellion. Uh, and this is the kind of little hint where you wonder whether this whole diatribe about, isn't about Ivan and that maybe Dostoevsky has read it, at least he is his name for stepping outside of life and rejecting it is rebellion, and so is Dostoevsky's. Uh, he couldn't, he says it's just too much for him. He couldn't stand it. But, but you need two passages put together to see this. At the bottom of 237, in the, that is in, pass, in 295, which is the Brief Habits piece, he says, most intolerable to be sure, and the terrible par excellence would be for me, that is Nietzsche, a life entirely devoid of habits, a life that would demand perpetual improvisation. That would be my exile in my Siberia. Now, maybe that, you might think, would be kind of a kind of nihilism, but it isn't. He says on 290 that that would be the most extreme, and I guess good kind of brief habit, though it's hard to picture what it would even be, if you look on, the, on 289 at the bottom, that's 347, 
but way into it. Uh, just at the very end of aphorism 347, that's page 289, he says, one can conceive such a pleasure and power of self-determination, such a freedom of the will, that the spirit would take leave of all faith and every wish for certainty, being practiced in maintaining himself on insubstantial ropes and possibilities and dancing even near abysses, such a spirit would be the very spirit par excellence. Now, I don't know for sure, but it looks like he's saying that's even freer than he can be with his feeling that he should sort of sink into each brief habit and hold on to it as long as it lasts. I guess. There the, I can't even picture what this free spirit would be because he, he wouldn't even hardly be outgrowing anything because he wouldn't be in anything in order to outgrow it. But I just read you what's there. Uh, you might come in and tell me some way to read this. You, you have a view about that? And even dancing around abysses, that doesn't seem like, I mean, maybe, but what would be then this most, well, never mind. Let's talk about it more. I mean, I don't know what it is. I just wanted to tell you, because last time I said I thought there was something about dancing somewhere in here, and I finally found it. So now, end of that. That's just a leftover little piece from last time. The, the main subject for this time is the almost free spirits, uh, and they include, and this is what's interesting, uh, uh, Jesus, and they would include Marco, and that begins to bring me to the similarities between Nietzsche and Dostoevsky on the one hand, and then the second half of the lecture, we'll get to the big differences between Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, and, begin, and that's where I want to sort of compare the various views of life that is, are being proposed by Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Dostoevsky. And finally, after that, if there's time today, and if not, that's fine, on Tuesday, I want to hear your views about, or take a vote at least, about which way of life is the one that you find convincing, if any. But it takes a while, so let's go. Um, so we got Nietzsche's Jesus. I told you to bring the Antichrist and the Twilights of the Idols. So we're on 152. And that is, he says, at the in in, in Aphorism 29, what I, what I am concerned with is the psychological type of the Redeemer. And we don't know yet what that means. And it starts out looking rather bad for the Redeemer from Kierkegaard's, from, from uh, Nietzsche's point of view. That is, he says, uh, where does he say it? Uh, or 155. He says it in about five lines down. One has to regret that no Dostoevsky lived in the neighborhood of this most interesting decadent. That's Jesus. I mean someone who could feel the thrilling fascination of such a combination of the sublime, the sick, and the childish. That should, if those of you read The Idiot, and I remember there were very few, that sounds like a very quick summary of the view of Jesus as the idiot in The Idiot. And that suggests that maybe Dostoevsky read it, people, uh, Nietzsche read it. People think that if Nietzsche has read any of the Dostoevsky novels, that would be the one he's read. But what, and it also could remind you of Markle, who is sublime and sick and childish, but is saying these uh, wonderful revealing of God and connectedness and love uh, pronouncements. So, but he is a decadent, so we have to understand what's that. He's not like a Socrates decadent. That's the next thing to say. I mean, Socrates was really decadent. I mean, his instincts were all in, in total chaos, and he wanted to die, and he was against the body and against life and so forth. That's the picture that comes down of Socrates from, through Plato. That's not at all like Jesus. And now comes the, one of the most surprising lines in the book about on 156, after all the ranting against Christianity about 
15 lines from the bottom. One could with some freedom of expression call Jesus a free spirit. He care, and now why would he do that? Well, he has certain things in common with Nietzsche as free spirit. He cares nothing for what is fixed. That's good. He's not, he's not according to Dostoevsky, in the eternity business. He's in the constant overcoming. The, the word killeth, everything fixed killeth. He's putting his version or his spin on it. The concept, the experience life, in the only form he knows it, is opposed to any kind of word, formula, law, faith, dogma. Remember, he, Jesus says he comes to fulfill the law. He doesn't have to obey the law anymore. He goes on the Sabbath and cures people. You're not supposed to do that. But it's, and, and Nietzsche's got something right there. That it's, remember, way back I said that's where your, your feeling, your desire, your joy or non-joy is the test of whether you're a good person or not. Not whether you obey the law or not. And that, that makes uh, Jesus, if you cut it up that way, sound like Nietzsche. Um, and he wants to, dis- but if you're going to say that, then you've got to distinguish Nietzsche from the Christians, what they made of Nietzsche. Uh, and that's uh, on 154. No, it isn't. That's still... Why am I saying that? Just a second. Ah, oh, I'm saying get ready for the fact that we're going to, he's going to be telling you about Jesus for a minute, but then he's going to tell you, of course, that the Christians immediately lost it. But he, this is still what makes Jesus look like a free spirit on 154. Uh, he says, at the t- uh, it's aphorism 31, I have anticipated my answer to the problem, that is the problem of Jesus, Its presupposition is that the type of the Redeemer has been preserved to us only in a very distorted form. So he's picturing his own view of what Jesus was doing and saying. And then he's telling you, boy, is that not what Paul, particularly he hates Paul, turned it into. But let's go on with what he thinks it is. He again goes back to Dostoevsky at the bottom of 154. That strange and sick world to which the Gospels introduces us, a world like that of the Russian novel, in which, the refu- in which refuse of society, neurosis, and childlike idios- idiocy seem to have a rendezvous, must in any case have coarsened the type. The first disciples in particular had to translate a being immensely, immersed entirely in symbols and incomprehensibilities. That's complicated. That says that Jesus, Jesus was talking in parables. Jesus was bringing in such a new world, that being a a super free spirit, he's opening up a whole new world. I mean, there was the ancient world, there was the Hebrew world, pretty soon there's going to be the Christian world, but the Christian world isn't here yet So at that point. So Jesus has to talk in parables and symbols, and these are incomprehensible, naturally, to the disciples who are still have the only only the old vocabulary and and only the Hebrew world to, to make sense of this, which can't make sense of so obviously they're going to get it wrong. So Nietzsche's got an argument, which is an interesting argument, that it must be distorted, what you're going to read in Paul and in the Gospels. They couldn't understand it. And every once in a while you see in the Gospels, the, the, Jesus says things and the disciples say things, and you can see Jesus is exasperated because the disciples haven't understood anything. And, uh, and, and that's because I mean, Jesus sounds to them crazy, just as Markle sounds to everybody. Crazy. Remember, Markle is the Jesus figure in the book, childlike, sick, with tuberculosis, brain fever, and uh, saying utterly incomprehensible things, or pretty incomprehensible, not really because 2,000 years of Christianity have made them comprehensible, but saying the servants should wa- wash the feet of their masters and saying we should love everything and everybody, even the birds. I don't think even Jesus said we should love the birds. St. Francis said it. And Markle says it. So, uh, so let me go a little further, the bottom of 154. So they translate these incom- incomprehensibilities into their own crudity in order to understand anything at all. For them, such a type could not exist until it had been reduced to more familiar terms. That's all exactly what I'm saying. And Nietzsche is absolutely right. That's bound to be a problem. Uh, but Jesus... 
you can glimmer through their incomprehension that Jesus is, as I said, against fixed moral laws. That was the bottom of 156. And um, a belief in, and then now look at the middle of 157. He thinks that, that the Christian soon be- thought Jesus was talking about denial, about denying your, your sensuous side, your body, your impulses, the sins in your members, as Paul would put it, and so forth. But he wasn't, according to Nietzsche. He says, denial is precisely what is totally impossible for him. Dialectics are likewise lacking. So he's not going around making arguments like Socrates. The idea is lacking that a faith, a truth, could be proved by reasons. That, that's, what he, that's what Socrates thinks. That's what, according to my son, Buddhists think. Buddhists, at least his kind of Tibetan Buddhist, I get constantly bombarded with arguments that are supposed to convince me that the Buddhist way of looking at things is true. That that's not Jesus. His proofs are inner lights, inner feelings of pleasure, self-affirmations, nothing but proofs by potency. That is very Nietzschean. I mean, he thinks that Jesus thinks sort of power and joy is evidence that he's on the right track. <coughs> uh, in effect... He sa- he's saying what Markle says, when Markle says that we're in paradise here and now if we would only see it. That is exactly what uh, Nietzsche's attributing to Jesus. If you look on 158 now, at the end of number 33, the profound instinct of how one would have to live in order to feel oneself in heaven, to feel oneself eternal, while in another condition, one by no means feels oneself in heaven. This alone is the psychological reality of redemption, a new way of living, not a new belief. Well, that's complicated, but what that says is, like Markle, if you feel that you're in heaven here and now, that is, as Markle puts it, if you're in paradise here and now, if you'd only see it, then you are in paradise. And that's what Jesus was defending, not some other world, but the the world, a way of living in this world that turns it into paradise and heaven here and now. In other words, it's all gotten existentialized by Nietzsche. So uh, one more on 159. So he's going to talk about the notion of the father and the son. And so he says, I grant, about five lines down, in the word son is expressed the entry into the collective feeling of the transfiguration of all things. In that sense, Markle is like Jesus, who is the son, not S-O-N, but S-U-N. But remember, the idea is that Markle and Jesus uh, manifest this new way of life, this loving way of life, and and it enters the world that way. The connectedness enters the world. So in the word, Father, this feeling itself, the feeling of perfection and eternity, I'm ashamed to recall what the church has made of this symbolism. So he's happy, uh, Nietzsche, with some feeling of, uh, if not an ocean of love quite, but some feeling of happiness here and now, power outside of the law, uh, and so forth. And uh, and, uh, suffering doesn't play any role in in his, his reconstruction of all this. So, yet, okay, so far so good. Anybody want to protest? I mean, you can protest that, boy, is this far from the Bible. But if I'd let you protest that, I should have, then I, then I would give you Nietzsche's story I just did. But you can't expect the Bible to get it right. It's too much new, too much a new world, a new sun, a new perspective, a new interpretation, a new everything for them to get it right. So we have to get it right. Nietzsche is going to fix it by existentializing it. But here's the next question. But why is then he called a decadent? So far, it looks like everything about him is the, the whole right. And well, gee, I didn't read the crucial sentence. How peculiar. What happened here? I mean, before we answer that, where is the... Uh, I'll find it in a minute. Uh, here we are, the top of 163. Oh, I was going to get there, but I'd rather read it right now. Uh, the, 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 the middle of... Hmm. Yeah, the top of 163. 
I, pres- I, I resume, I shall now relate the real history of Christianity. The word Christianity is already a misunderstanding. In reality, there has been only one Christian, and he died on the cross. 